an educator at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she develops cross-disciplinary design research initiatives and curricula with the Colleges of Engineering and Health Sciences. Previously, Ms. Blair Early worked as an interaction designer, educator, and researcher for the University of Cincinnati in the College of Design, Art, Architecture, and Planning, and their Center for Design, Research, and Innovation, and LiveWell Collaborative. Her research into principles of interaction and cross-disciplinary design curricula have been presented and published both nationally and internationally. Ms. Blair Early has an MGD from North Carolina State University's uh, School of Design. Thank you very much. I that she's doing one of the best things that you can find in education, which is to integrate science with art. <laughs> Um, and I apologize for those of you guys that saw this earlier. It's just a little bit that's different, so if you want to leave now, you're friend in. Um, so I, I did make a few changes to my earlier presentation because this was longer, but uh, this is about, more specifically, uh, a series of courses, but I'm going to talk a lot about some research that happened last semester um, where we created 3D printed prosthetics as part of a larger printing prosthetics movement. Um, but we did it in the context of the art building and the School of Art and Design. And we've been working with engineers and health scientists. Um, and we've been, we've been creating these sort of integrated classrooms as part of a, a couple of new initiatives in the school. So th this is just a, a quote, but it's sort of one of the mantras. And I, I think that there's a couple of things that, um, that I do as an educator. If I find something and I hold on to it because it means something significant to me. But this, this quote of the significant problems we face uh, cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them is an important one, right? It's the same thinking that caused the problem is not the same thinking that's going to fix the problem. And that's where I think my students are this incredible model for me is because they come in different. They come in different. They have less prejudice than I do myself. And I, I don't see myself as, as an older educator. I see myself as fresh and young still. And, I'm still amazed by what my students bring in. And in this instance, you'll see younger and younger children. It's even more incredible to see what they bring in. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is a collaborative work environment between me and a, a colleague, Frankie Flood. And Frankie Flood came from jewelry and metal smithing, of all things. Um, he is uh, a jack of all trades and can, can build a motorcycle from scratch and is just incredibly talented. But he comes out of art. And he does really interesting projects with wheelchairs, and we're doing these 3D printed prosthetics, and we've created spasticity devices for health scientists. We're looking at um, gaming and, and uh, weight loss and activity for kids, and these are all sort of places that if you have knowledge of the materials, then you can kind of jump in and be part of that process. I came from a more traditional design background. All of my courses since I've been here at the University of Wisconsin um, in Milwaukee have been based in universal design largely and looking at aging in place. So I've worked a lot with health sciences pretty much since I got here. My background is actually in interaction design. And so I did a lot of research originally in interaction design and I applied that to wayfinding and interactive environments. So the same as earlier, the teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but one who is herself taught in dialogue with the students who in turn while being taught also teach. They become jointly responsible for a process in which all grow, and that's a really important thing to this research. I shared in the earlier um, presentation that I had never 3D printed, I had never used, actually, Rhino, I've done some 3D programming, none of that before January of this year. So you're looking at someone who is as fresh as the students, I learned about two weeks ahead of them. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but it was great to be part of that process because I understood their struggles. Right? We also brought up problems together. It was a really collaborative environment, and it's the first time where I was in a situation that was truly that collaborative. Or collaborative. So the reason we got to this is we're having problems in a traditional design education, and in particular in our education um, at UWM, we have buffet-style course often offerings. So we have a, a series that we tend to choose, and the university, due to budget cuts, if there's not 16 students in a classroom, we don't run it. Right? And Art in the past has been somewhat insulated from that. So we have classes with eight students. We have this incredible luxury where I knew my students. I knew from the moment they walked in if they were having a good or a bad day, right? I knew when they were nervous to speak in front of other people. Now the classes get bigger and bigger, and a lot of times even in our, our workspaces, we don't have enough space. So 
they've created these buffet where we kind of pick and choose and we allow the students to pick and choose, but there's not really a consistency that moves from class to class. Um, design, I think every, every area right now has an increasing use of technology. By the time I finish a year at school, I'm going back in and running new things in the existing programs as well as gaining new programs, um, which again was a big deal this year. Tight budgets, and then um, we need entrepreneurial students with knowledge of technology, critical thinking, and manufacturing processes. And it's not enough for our design students to come in and say they can design for an app. We're asking them to create that app. It's not enough, even though we don't have an industrial design uh, department right now in our, our school, it's not enough for us to talk about products. It's enough for us to understand how they're physically made, to understand the supply chain, to understand how they're going to be made, environmental impact. We understand the life cycle of them, what happens in the life cycle. So, uh, so why collaborate? It offers increased student responsibility and learning. In this instance, we're not just collaborating with engineering and health sciences, we're collaborating with families, right, who are in need of these things. And so there was increased responsibility on all levels. I had students who blossomed, I had students who came in who typically would, you know, turn in something late, and there was no real repercussion other than a grade. And grades sometimes aren't a really, really big repercussion to students. But when they know the nine-year-old girl that they're working with, they became invested in that process. They became truly invested in that process. Um, also working with students from engineering who had completely different work ethics, <coughs> right? Working with students from health science, again, completely different work ethics. We found that they created a completely different dynamic in the classroom. The ideation and prototyping becomes a complete necessity. So they had to show each other because we didn't share a common language and that's something even just watching some of your presentations, you know, we don't always share the same language. Um, and so not sharing that language, the students prototyped, they showed each other how they were doing it. They had to create things to see if it worked, if it didn't work, and sometimes that necessity was just based on language. Uh, to broaden the classroom dialogue, students spoke to each other, they learned to speak to each other, they learned to speak to I mean, I'll call her a client or a user. They learn to talk to the family. They learn to talk to the media. They learn to talk to shared friends in this instance. And then it allowed the students to experience the project as users and colleagues. So we want to expose our students to relate situations and users in order to facilitate the storage and carriage of practical experiences into the future. We wanted them. about is the, the creation of a series of 3D printed um, hand prosthetics that the students had made for um, local and international, local and non-local kids. Um, but prior to, oh, oh sorry, um, but prior to that we had worked on, uh, it, it won't click on me so that you can just see the thing. Oh, sorry. Um, but prior to that we had worked on aging in place, so we worked on sink basins, we reorganized the kitchen. We actually created um, a cookbook and a learning to cook um, uh, manual and series of utensils for, um, for my husband is a special ed teacher who teaches moderate to severe cognitive disabilities. So they worked on that. So there's been a plethora, but specifically I'm talking about the 3D printed hands today, but they learn through doing and through making. So some of the history and, and where this started is um, when I started at the university, the chancellor was currently, well actually he just left this year, but the chancellor was currently the dean of engineering. And uh, we looked at gaining some grants where we could build an interdisciplinary place. Um, and these were some of the facts that we actually used in some of the grants, so that's <laughs> where these were pulled from. But in 1963, the U.S. filed more than 81% of the world's patents. But since that time, um, Japan, China, South Korea, and India have filed more than 52% of the world patents in 2007, and Asia was forecasted to have 90% of all practicing engineers by 2010. I don't know if that's true or not. Those are the earliest dates that I could find. Uh, China was forecasted to graduate nearly 500,000 engineers in 2009, compared with 60,000 in the U.S. The Design Council in the U.K. found that companies known for innovative design outperformed an average company by 200% between 1994 and 2003. So design came to this saying that they needed additional testing, material studies, and project-based work, and engineering and health sciences came to us saying, we want creativity and problem solving, we want sort of that, that joy in making, we want iteration and user knowledge. So in 2006, Art and Design began exploring viable curricular ways in which to collaborate using material fabrication research with jewelry and metal smithing. Um, 
and we were working in particular with art and design and architecture. Uh, engineering and desi design began in 2008, that's when I started, and that's when we started teaching our first two classes in conjunction with engineering. Um, again, using project-based, user-centered, and material-centric research. In 2012, we got involved with Health Sciences and Aurora Healthcare, which is the large medical system. Um, again, looking project-based, user-centered, material-centric research into universal design and specifically aging in place and adaptive devices. This falls under technically the adaptive devices. And then in 2013 and 2014, we launched a cross-disciplinary collaboration between the arts, which is Tech School of the Arts, Engineering, the College of Engineering um, and Applied Sciences, and Health Sciences, um, and a professional collaboration at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Aurora Healthcare. We actually, two weeks before I came out here, we went to the VA Center, and we were working with doctors at the VA Center and their mobility lab. Um, and we've created a certificate program in universal design and innovation that is shared by engineering, design, and health sciences. And we have a new BA and BFA uh, program in digital fabrication and design, which again, pulls people from jewelry and metalsmithing, design, engineering, health sciences. We're very inclusive and it creates this really interesting space. Um, so a couple of things that we're always looking at is what's the role of the educator and the learner in these sort of situations? Um, and, and how do we see our roles in there? Uh, what's the interaction in the learning space? So in the learning space, we have something called the DCRL, which is the Digital Craft Research Lab, um, which is interesting because it's actually separated from the college. It's in a separate building called Kenilworth Square. And Kenilworth Square is all graduate students and faculty. There are three undergraduate courses that are taught there, but again, it's this really dynamic space <coughs> because the students are in, in conjunction and in the, the same proximity to teachers and their spaces their studio. It's a beautiful building. It's kind of close to downtown. It's really exciting. And it's a reason why students want to be sort of involved in that space. Um, the learning space in relation to the dissemination of knowledge. So it's, it's in the middle of everything, right? We're really close to a medical center right there. We're really close to the lake and some really great uh, companies. We have galleries nearby. So we have lots of sort of traffic in that space. Um, the ways in which the knowledge will be revealed, discovered, and owned. This is a big one, one that Frankie and I uh, agree kind of um, wholeheartedly on is that all of our work is open source. So we don't want to own um, <laughs> sort of any sort of, what? No. Uh, th these are actually part of a larger group. We actually have fine tuned some of these and we're working on new ones, we're working on parametric models, but everything that we do, as soon as we put it out there, it's put open source, right? All of the work that the students do is being compiled into a book. We've created a series of videos. All of that's getting ready to launch out there. Everything that we do is free. And the idea is that the university in particular doesn't need to own stuff like this. Right? We don't need to patent this. We don't need to keep it to ourselves. Part of it is the students are generating research and they're learning how to be generous with the global community. And so they're putting it out there. And so that's part of our goal. But can I ask a question? Those students who may develop this skill, these crafts, be able to go on, wouldn't it be nice for them to go full circle with it and not just develop it, but understand the whole process, what it takes to do the patent, to bring it to manufacturing, to go the whole route to have a craft like this, and then to make it something sustainable once they get out of the university, that they see the whole thing go right to the business model. Wouldn't it be good to make that inclusive? We do actually, um, I mentioned in the earlier, design has kind of changed and what we did is, is pretty much uh, about a year after I showed up there, we took our design courses that were traditional design offerings, web design, you know, interface design, posters, typography, things that you would normally see in a design program. And we changed those and we added two larger tracks, right? So the universal design and we added um, a track in entrepreneurial design. And so students take I'm apparently being kicked off. Um, <laughs> um, hang on a second here. All right, you guys are all going to get to go see my password here. <laughs> um, so, um, but we, we added entrepreneurial in there. Um, and so the idea is that students actually do follow that process. They have um, one of their their main courses that every design student has to take. 
Thank you. All right. One of the things that they have to do is they have to take this course, and that's where they go through entrepreneurialism, they go through um, innovating a product, product realization, but then they also go through licensing, and they go through, we, we work with um, the graduate school, they talk about patenting, they talk about the patent cycle, we talk about licensing, they learn about copyright and trademark, so the students do get that. So it's actually, it's in a different track, it's just not one that we teach in that piece, I think some of these fall under social media. Well, and, and to take this advice like that to the published marketplace is $10 million from the time that you file the initial right. patent request, you're talking 15 years, you're talking a year to push your patent through, you're talking 15 years to do your testing, and a minimum of 10 years to $10 million to get an FDA approval. So that's a long cycle right. for a student patent. But your provisional patent application will cut that short. You've got to be within a year to deal with that with the PTA. You don't have to file a patent per se. That's the whole point. A lot of these companies, what they do, they'll do a PTA, they'll modify the PTA, and there's a technique for doing this. You yeah, keep that medical PTA. device. So it still has to go through 510K. It's a medical device. Yeah, but so you, it you keep it at a PTA level. Um, no, you, you, to take it to the marketplace, you have to take it past the 510K level. You can't market it until you approve Well, that's for medical devices, but the other stuff. Right, the other stuff is a PTA. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But, but we don't patent it. Everything is open source and it's part of a larger community. So, um, right, we skirted the whole issue, he right? Happens, he happens to be the president of the Association of Innovation and the Patent. Well, it's it's better assistance league. <laughs> so, oh, there you go. <laughs> so maybe you can get some, you know, support. There we go. Um, two other things that we evaluate against is the positive impact on the student community. We're always asking the students, the students, how they feel about this, right? Because we are, I, I mean, when we're talking about risk assessment and teachers, that's actually something that we're cognizant of, is are we, are we going down the right path? How are the students feeling about it? Um, and then, are they able to get jobs? So every five years, the design department does an audit to figure out how many of our students are working, are working in the field, are happy in the field, are doing that. So we're constantly evaluating, and then the positive impact on the local and global community, right? Uh, so we're changing how we teach design, and we're changing how we create our designers. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, because um, I'm not sure how much time we have, but we have a mission and it's to develop and implement a unique curricular program that trains our next generation of technology, design, and business leaders to generate new and innovative products <laughs> that will promote and strengthen the national and regional economy, as well as better the lives of the local and global community. We are, you know, I've always been accused of being Pollyanna and, and that, I, that I want the world to change. I think that's the most wonderful thing about being an educator of college students is every single one of my students comes in and they are passionate and they believe that they're going to change the world. Some of them think they're going to be rock stars still. Some of them think they're going to design a t-shirt line. But some of them truly want to change the world even in some small way. And what this class is doing and what these series of courses are doing is we're showing <coughs> that people can make an immediate impact. We're showing their impact as they're making it. Um, and so, in every course, we evaluate against creativity, design process, methodology, fabrication, product realization, and then innovi innovation and commercialization. And to your point, in the uh, aging in place, there were some students that took that and they're bringing it into a more commercial environment because they're looking at the, the space. Or your point, sorry. <laughs> so, I can go through this. So, we're going from limited design to a global design process. We're showing the students further and further where their outreach is, um, and I'm gonna go through this a little bit fast because I talked about it earlier, but we always are solving design problems at the community level, right? Because we're a global community and it's really important that the students see beyond creating, uh, in particular our designers, but all of our students see beyond creating an initial product. And I actually want them to see beyond the business plan and beyond the commercialization of it, is how big is the actual problem? So we're always asking them to define the problem. What is the actual problem? Who is it affecting and how big is it? So this is Chris Jones and he's sort of our, our um, he's our, um, our basis for it. And so we're always in that system and community level of design problems. Again, this is just the general methodology for design courses. This is the language that we're teaching all of them so that they're all on the same page and when we're talking about design. Um, our research is iterative, it's collaborative, it's self-evaluated, uh, self um, and we use participatory research, ethnographic research, and then this idea of material and testing for product realization. 
So participatory research is iterative and it's collaborative problem solving with data-driven analysis. It's reflective, and the reason I want to talk about reflective is we have not had time to reflect on this. This is brand new. Like I said, <coughs> January is when the first request came in, the beginning of January. Our class started January 21st, I believe, right? So we had 21 days to pull everything together. We ran them through. We have our students there all summer working on this, and so we're just now pulling this together and starting to reflect on what we actually have in front of us and how we build on it going forward, and then self-evaluation. Um, we want the students as both designers and audience, right? And that's something that's really important. And when we, when we talk to our designers, our designers always say they learn so much from working with engineering and health sciences because they have all of this knowledge. And it stinks because as a designer, they don't get any of this knowledge. And then we talk to the engineers and health sciences and they say, it's so interesting how much you focus on the person and how much you watch that person and how much insight you gain into that person. So they really are starting to learn from each other. They work in multidisciplinary teams. All of their work is team style, right? And students invest more in design solutions. Ethnographic, because we want an emic, or um, we want them watching the people, understanding them in their native context, right? So they want an emic perspective or a native point of view. So in that instance, so for Shay, they had to understand what it was to be a nine-year-old girl to the best of their ability. And how we did that is Shay's entire third grade class, who's 89 year old, showed up. We were actually expecting 16. We didn't understand they meant the entire third grade. They all drove out in buses and they came and visited. And the students spent time working with them and talking to the teachers. And we had this really wonderful presentation where we talked about what we were doing for Shay, all the different materials that we were using, about the equipment that we were using. We let every student design a hand, right? So they all traced it their hand and then they told us what they would like Shay's hand to be. And I don't know if any of you guys have kids, but I would say probably half of them wanted frozen Elsa hands and all the boys wanted rocket launchers and fireballs. <laughs> and so I have hundreds of pages of drawings of hands where they're saying, this is shooting fire. <laughs> so, um, but again, it's, it's important to understand that our research right now is currently uh, not quantitative. It's not quick, it's not replicable. Uh, replicable and it's not based in large quantities. We're basing it on individuals, the children that we're working with currently. Our research is time intensive, it's qualitative, and it's inter interested in depth, um, and it's interpretive. So how we're reading into it is even interpretive. So this is where we talk about our space a little bit. The DCRL is the Digital Craft Research Lab. That actually only came into existence two years ago, and it begged borrowing and stealing, right? We had um, small grants and um, begging for a space. And so what we've created is we've got uh, a dirty room and a clean room, and it's in Kenilworth, and the clean room is the classroom, and it has uh, workstations, hand tools, machine, uh, machine working, or sorry, metal working machines, woodworking machines, 3D printing and scanning, and laser and vinyl cutting. So that's the clean room, right? You're seeing the computer stations. Actually, since then, it's changed quite a bit. Um, we actually, these are in the back. These are rep rep machines. And the funny story about that is the first one we built four years, maybe three years ago. And it's essentially, it's just a, a homemade um, a 3D printer that you can make for about $300 with the materials. And so we had a class where we taught the students to make it. And then all the students made other ones. So they sort of replicate it. So they're giving birth. And so they're lying everywhere. <laughs> but we've got lots of rep rep machines. We have, um, that's it from another view. We have vinyl cutting, which the students find all sorts of things. You know, they're, um, well, they, they use it for stickers, for whatever. Um, we have laser cutters, which we use largely for leather, but we tried cutting thermoplastic on it. We cut the foam, actually. We found that the, the foams that we cut cut really well with that. So, you know, we just sort of play. Everything in there is sort of made to be played with. Um, we use Rhino and 3D Studio Max. Um, we are also using Inventor, and we're sort of expanding out to some other programs. Uh, we have handheld and um, uh, a non-handheld 3D scanner. And so basically, the, this is from the handheld. It just turns everything into a low poly mesh. And then that low poly mesh, we can actually take, this is Frankie, um, into MakerBot, which kind of made all of this possible. If you haven't used MakerBot, it's a really simple software that before you had to do a lot of work just to get stuff ready to go to those rep racks. 
Makerware is basically you bring in something called an STL, which is actually a garbage file. It's a yucky file. You can't really do that much with it. Um, but you can take that in there. You can adjust sizes. And basically, it allows you to print really easily to uh, the MakerBot. And that's a 3D printed uh, Frankie bust, right, that we sort of play with. And so we have um, the five MakerWare or MakerBots. We have one that's just a MakerBot 2, which just says PLA. We have two Form 1s, which are resin-based printers. We have, I believe, five or six rep reps that are sitting in the room, laser cutter, vinyl cutter, and we continue to add to it. And the idea is that the, the really interesting thing is the students are all becoming technicians now too, right? At first it was a little scary to let them use this because even though it's only a $3,500 machine and our laptops are probably more than that, it's expensive because we had to fight so much just to get them and we didn't want the students to screw them up, but what we found is now it's taking them apart. So um, starting here, this is the first visit with Shay. Shay actually, her mom contacted us because Shay, um, last Christmas, wanted a 3D printed hand that she had read about in one of the science magazines. And this is a big project. We're not the only people doing this. You probably have seen it all over the place. There are a lot of people who are doing 3D printing for their family members. They're doing it for universities, right? It's, it's, not, it's not just us doing it. Um, but our whole family, we invited them to come out. We showed them all of the equipment in there. We actually did scans of both of them so that her sister felt important. We made them part of our process. Everyone got journals, they write down what they like, what they don't like, what's working, what's not working. Questions they have. We sent Shay's parents home with her very first hand, and on the way home, one of the pieces of plastic snapped, and she had no idea what it was made with and how to do it, and it's a 40-minute drive. I mean, we made every mistake that we could make, but they were partnered with us, and they understood. Um, so, we, you know, we traced her hand, we 3D scanned it, you can see the handheld scanner right there. Um, we brought that in. And then we started placing pieces, and this is how the models are, um, and we could size them based on her hand. So this is actually part of the first hand that we built for Shay. We used her affected and her non-affected hand, because what we were really looking to do is make sure that we kept them in size, right? One of the things that was really wonderful is the first thing that the design student said is, well, this is a little girl. This is a point where she's building her self-identity. We want this to be something that she wants to wear, right? And the thing that I think most people don't realize is they say, well, why not just use a prosthetic? Well, because prosthetics are thousands upon thousands of dollars and kids grow really quickly. Shay has grown out of two, right? So her parents, first of all, don't want to be spending that kind of money on, on prosthetics. And a lot of times what we've had is several kids who don't want to wear a realistic pr prosthetic. These are fun. They can be any color they want. They can put stickers on them. They can do whatever they want, <laughs> right? And there's something freeing about that. Um, this is actually, and this is where I brought my little sheet. So part of the, the larger bit is that is um, Ivan Owen. And the first one you might have heard of was the Robo Hand, and that's Richard Van Az and Ivan Owen. And that has since been pulled off. It was originally open source, and it was made for a little boy, and they were two parts of the globe. Uh, Ivan Owen actually was a puppeteer and had all this knowledge about creating puppets. And the two of them got together and created the first Robo Hand for this little boy. And since then, RoboHand has become a separate entity. It's become its own corporation, and they ask for either a $500 to $1,000 donation in order to receive it. Since then, a whole bunch of people have picked it up, and a lot of different hands have come out. Um, what you see here is this is the 2012. You can see how quickly this is moving, right? So the machine metal from 2012 using thermoplastic. And again, that DIY, just figuring out how to make this work as a puppeteering piece. The one on the right in 2014, is actually something called the talon hand. And this is a shade talon hand, a modified talon hand. Again, every crazy color. When we asked her what she wanted more than anything, she wanted fingernails. That was, that was her wish. Um, but this is a talon hand, and that was designed by a man named Peter Binkley for his son, Peregrine. Um, and it was kind of a DIY. His son, his son is actually older. And um, this was based off of that. It uses leather armbands. Um, this is actually based off of something called the Cyborg Beast. It's now the remix and this is actually the UWM design and has some things. There's actually changes to it now where they use um, a BOA closure system from Snowden, right? That makes the tensioner easy. Right? So it's changing at, at warp speed. Every time you go up, there's a new one up there. It's kind of exciting. Um, but it's moved quite a bit. This is a, What? 
which is in Africa, um, where they're, they're creating these kind of arms and they bring our maker box and they bring them into villages, remote villages, they train them how to make it and then they have basically a prosthetic generator, right? Um, so this is Bob Roth, who is actually a machinist who made a finger with this for uh, a friend's hand. Um, and I think that's the finger that he originally, and it's a fully articulated um, finger. That's Peregrine's hand. Uh, that's the, he, I think he's like, maybe 17 to 19, and that's his original one. He worked with his dad, and they built this hand. There's some more. Um, when Shay came in, we made a mold so that the students would have access to her more often. They all met her, but we wanted to make sure that they had access and they could fit it. That was actually a mistake because it's locked in in that place, so then we were making things too big, and obviously the thumb could fold in, but you can see that she has um, the uh, almost a full palm a partial thumb and then obviously missing fingers. There's her little hand. And again, I mentioned earlier, we tried everything. We used thermoplastic, right? We'd never done thermoplastic. We downloaded something. We talked to health science. Health sciences, that's actually how they got really interested to do it. What are you doing with the thermoplastics? And so we learned about <laughs> splinting. We have a graveyard of tools and uh, lots of hands. We have hundreds of hands and hand pieces lying around that have broken. You can see these are some Roth fingers in there. They actually have an extra joint. Uh, and that was actually the very first hand that we printed for Shay. This was the second one. That's the one that's going these around. Are huh? Yep, yeah, these are printed. They're using ABS plastic. So you put the software and this thing actually comes out of it. Yep, out of a printer. I'll sh you'll see it in the video. So that's her trying it on, and that's her picking it up. And I'll, I'll show you guys this because this was this was the best moment. This is the very first time we didn't even know if it would work. And um, what you'll see is actually when she finally lifts it up, it's the very first time that she kind of jumps back a little bit when she does it. Oh, so let's see this. Did she try? Yeah. And she kind of jumps, right? I also, I also Yes, it was this exciting moment. And I don't know if you can hear it, but like Frankie and I were bawling, right? And the students are bawling when they see this because they got to see it. And even though this is kind of a novelty, she wears this for maybe two hours, three hours at a time, right? And I'll show you more examples. But she was our first one, and we didn't even know if it would work, and it worked, right? So there was this excitement around that. Um, Sorry. All right. I'm hurrying up. I'm almost done. So then students, you know, they jumped in and they started looking at hands. They looked at things that she wanted to do. They were sketching, building out things. This is actually the talon. She wanted to fix the thumb. There's students in the space. This is Sharice Ford. And her whole thing was she wanted to create a, a Bob Roth finger that would print in place. And what that means is instead of actually having to print all these different pieces and string them together and put them together with bolts, she wanted one thing that you printed it, you cracked it, and it worked. And she spent the entire semester, but she got it to work, which was incredible. And so that's one of the most exciting things that happened. And as soon as that went out, people couldn't believe that she had developed a print-in-place articulated finger, which means no putting it together and no extra um, hardware. So those are her print-in-place fingers. And then she actually, again, she used the Bob Ross, which again uses this motion on the wrist, if possible, so that you can change the motion of the fingers. We had students that tried cork. We had students that tried to make things out of metal. We had students that tried to machine things. Um, this was looking at how 
strong the cork was, in particular when they put those air holes in. And then he wanted to create a breakaway one because in the winter she couldn't get her coat on and off. And so she went ahead and he went ahead and he created one like that. There's one that was interesting to costuming, and so she was designing covers for them that were interesting. This is a student that wanted to do without any wrist, and actually Bella, although she has a wrist, she has almost no palm. Um, so we're really struggling with her right now. Um, she's also four. She has an extremely shortened arm. Actually, this of a four-year-old. Sorry. That's okay. It's, it's two seconds. This is the length of Bella's entire arm. So, yeah, so she has uh, extreme shortening because of the muscles, and she has a, almost no wrist. And so what we need to do is we need to make her... Um, Um, so uh, in her case, we need to do something that's not going to be utilizing the wrist. So a student actually worked on making one of these, right, which again, am I behind on time? Okay. Um, I've got to find my... Okay, and so then this is one of the students in the class. This is Joe, and again, this this may not seem like a lot to you, but it's really incredible that he thought this through and figured out how to make it work. Um, so this doesn't utilize the wrist, it utilizes arm motion. And you can see that he can move the fingers at different times based off the turning, so you have a little bit more um, free motion with it. This was obviously an early prototype, so because he doesn't know what to do with the arm pieces, but that's what we're working on for Bella right now. So something that would pick up here and then allow her to not use her wrist. Okay. So last, right, not, but not least, uh, we have student teachers. So that's Kayvon. That is actually Bella. Her affected arm is behind her. And he is now Bella's teacher and creator, and he meets with her. And he has that sense of building it. He's given her ownership. He's taken the class. He's really competent. We still sort of organize and uh, double check his work, but he gets Okay, well, so that's, that's Bella, and then this is John, who's actually making one right now currently for a boy named Kai uh, in Colorado. Um, and then I have two videos, if, oops, there, if there's time, but I'll go through... Um, sort of our lessons. The, the good is that the students are fearless, right? They came into this, they weren't afraid to try things, and they're learning not to be afraid of their mistakes, which was something that we all had to go through together. They invested in the process and the product. They now have the ability to pay it forward. We're bringing in high school students, local high school students who want to try and do this through their engineering club, and we're training them with the students. Um, it offers educational opportunities and technology that don't tr traditionally exist in design, so we're teaching them high tech, in design standards. Um, it's empowering to the students, it's empowering to the teachers, and it's empowering to the users, right? The bad was equipment maintenance was really difficult, right? So we were constantly keeping up on it. Um, the learning curve and tech help. One of the things that I found as a teacher is I've never had to teach a class with this much new content in it. And so, and it was a large class, we had a lot of interest. We had 21 students. Um, in, a, in a room that had 19 chairs. <laughs> so um, it was difficult because we were constantly working with them. And we had students that had never used uh, a drill, right? So it wasn't just, I don't know how to 3D print, it's like, I don't know how to drill through this hole to get this larger or anything else like that. So there was a lot of help. There was a lot of translation issues between engineering, health science, and design. So we were constantly talking about, okay, we're here, we have to get on the same page. Environmental waste. We have a graveyard, we have tons of plastic, unused ABS plastic, or used ABS plastic, and we don't have a way to recycle it yet. They are, I mean, there are some people that do recycle it, but we don't have the ability yet. The cost, we do it free, but it costs us. You know, some of it's come out of Frankie in my pocket. We actually had a little girl in Scotland whose family did a fundraiser and donated $3,000 to the school, so we have a lot of money right now, but for a while it was difficult. Um, the students, it was hard to have them find comfort in making mistakes. It was, it's really a wonderful thing. Once you get comfortable with making mistakes, and it's easy to say that, but it's 
really hard to do it. And so it was a difficult process to get them to find that comfort, trying things again and again and again. And then it was this extreme version of DIY. I spent more time, right, the funny, lost in Michael's, going, where's your beating aisle? Let me see this cord. Let me stretch this. I mean, I think they thought I was nuts because I would come in and I'd pull it and I'd be stretching things. And they didn't know what to make of that. Ace Hardware loved me, you know, because I came in and I had to ask for 065 screws. And, you know, and I just, I didn't even know the names of some of the things. Uh, another funny thing is third graders are really honest. They told ex exactly what they liked and exactly what they thought was stupid. That's a stupid color. That's a stupid design. Those fingers are too big, right? <laughs> They're very honest with how they feel about it. Four-year-olds are brutally honest. Brutally honest. I don't like this. I don't want it at all, right? I just spent 20 hours <laughs> doing all the little fine tuning and you don't like it because you wanted it to be a different pink. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fireballs in Frozen, which we found was really, really cute. But one of the, the most interesting things was when we had those 80 kids, every single one of them knew what they wanted their hand. And it was, I think it was an unexpected, brilliant moment for us is we brought them in because we thought it was educational for the students to learn about it. And they were in there and they wanted to know about 3D printing. But part of us was worried that we were giving Shay these over-the-top hands. And how will students accept that? Would she just be, yeah, we didn't want her to be picked on and we didn't want her to be like an object of like, oh, look at that. And so we made the students all part of that. And the teachers were really on board with that. And it was really incredible, though, to see how uninhibited that third grade, they just took it in stride. They thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And could you make it pink? And could you do this? And could you make it shoot fireballs? Or what if there was a rocket? And then they had really wonderful ideas that they would send us an email and said, you please do this for shade. They one wanted to use the little laser pointers. <laughs> and could you put the little lasers on there just so that it would work? They had all sorts of great ideas. Um, and so the last thing that I'll leave you on is I have two videos. If, if you want to stay, otherwise I can end right here. Um, the first, one of the things that we did learn is that this is Evan. Evan is different because Evan lost his fingers this past winter in a um, uh, snowblower. And he's in Wisconsin, so he's always had use of his dominant hand. And so all of these other kids have ABS or they have a blood clot, but they've grown up without their hands. Right? So they've adapted, and so they use it differently. You know, it's kind of a novelty, it's exciting, they move a cup from one hand to another. Well, Evan got his, and he got it by a mail, and his dad sent us this video. But this is like a day or two after he got it. And he's throwing, I mean, he's whipping this ball across at his dog. That's his dominant hand. He's used to having those fingers, so he uses it differently. So you kind of see you kind of see the difference. And again, these are really limited in functions. They're not meant to replace a prosthetic. We're very clear on that. We, we have no intention of replacing prosthetics. But it is a, it's a nice option for kids who normally either don't want a prosthetic or don't have access to them to gain any, back. Any legal problems that you provide something that's not FDA approved? We have an entire, like, huge sheet that we give to the parents that talks about care, instruction, and it gives, it gives them all that information that this is not FDA approved. We won't make it for someone younger than three because of falling. We're working well, with. No, I'm very interested in oh, sorry. Uh, are you worried? Uh, are you ethical if you're keeping the business? If that's true. Mm -hmm. I'm asking that we, as someone like the FDA care, that you're creating non standard devices. You know, we haven't. To be honest, I don't know. I, it hasn't come up yet. Yeah, I don't. I don't know yet. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Um, this is the last thing, and I can just play it as you guys leave. This is, the, and this is a little bit cheesy because it was. Yes. Oh well. Do you want to make a comment that way people can leave? Okay, my comment is just you know. Uh, when I uh, read the, the review of your paper, I will was. Impacted and I went to the video paper. My impact at the theoretical level, at the methodological level, is that this is the best example I could find in a long time about a systemic methodology as opposed to a systematic one. Thank and you. it's one of the very, the very few things that I found in my life. Maybe it's my life, but not.
Yo sigo a Taimi y integrating successfully art with science and engineering and integrating thinking and acting. In my life, I didn't see that frequently, let alone in the university. So now I have a question that might show my ignorance on the subject. How frequent is this kind of things in the university? Not corporation. In the university. I think that there are there are lots of, of universities that are doing interesting projects. Maybe not exactly this. Uh, Creighton is actually doing something similar. It's in an engineering. They, they're not involving art and design. But I think that... Uh, you see, that's what I mean. My, what, what I mean is integrating art with science, with engineering, but at the same time, you are integrating learning, uh, I'm sorry, uh, thinking with acting, but at the same time, you are integrating research, education, and real life problem solving. I never seen that I, I in mean, any I, university. So maybe I feel special, I am, but I think there there are other schools out there. I, I don't know them all offhand, but there. I mean, we feel like we're special, right? But at the same time, this kind of integration at the same time. D school is a really wonderful school. Um, I read about 20,000 papers in seven years. So I'm just going to play this. And you guys are welcome to leave if you need to. So that's Shay. That's Frankie. I've got to do something. Maybe the internet for fast. I saw those videos of taking that stuff. My car is cool. That's actually a 3D print of her affected hand. She prints her own hand. Hello, Miss Jones. We can change We can do something. We can do something. You are aware of the American Association of Investment Science every year that have a part. And science. Yeah, we have a lot of to talk to her and interact with her, and it's really cool to see her put on the hands of a new design. And she's really, really, like, really yeah. What is it? Yeah. The American Association of Science. Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah, and so check it out on the website, triple A S dot org. Triple A dot triple A Triple A S A A A S dot org. American Association of Advanced Science. It's gonna make money with what you're doing. Huh? It's gonna make money with what you're doing. It's just nice because you can see that's the printers at work. Um, these are some of the students. You can see their original, like, models. I broke 10 crank telephones. Yeah. <laughs> We have a blended all of our students. You just see it. You know, they had a big scandal last year about printing guns. I know. If any people is printing guns here that she shouldn't be doing, leave them out of the room when they are unique. Because yesterday, this room was full of everything. So the people coming after to the room. I think you can. 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 I think you can.